She's replacing your former yeoman, sir. Now, she does a good job, all right. It's just that I can't get used to having a woman on the bridge. Well, that was sexist. When analyzing the original series pilot, The Cage, it stands as a curious primer that illustrates the rustic sense of Starfleet, the quote-unquote early days. We see how often there's a struggle for the crew, even with the advanced technology. To quote Janeway, Starfleet officers were a little slower to invoke the Prime Directive and a little quicker to pull their phasers. The episode itself starts out with the Enterprise, no bloody A, B, C, or D, returning to the Vega colony for medical assistance and replacement of lost crew after a recent conflict. Things get a bit tense when the Enterprise itself runs into a radio wave. Apparently, the sensors of the Enterprise would identify radio waves and somehow think they were on par with asteroids or some other object which could damage the vessel. Which makes all kinds of sense as we know vessels intercepting radio waves and thinking that it's an actual object in front of them is an issue that occurs today. And definitely did in the 1960s. Yeah. However, after figuring out what it actually was, the Enterprise is able to determine that the radio wave was actually an emergency SOS from a ship that went missing roughly 18 years ago in the Talos Star Group. To pause here a moment and jump forward in the story a bit, the distress call comes from a crashed ship that presents a pretty large continuity gaff, or at least a retcon. The ship, apparently, didn't have warp capability and the crew were unaware that warp even existed. We know this because later one of the crew tells the survivors about how ships can now travel at warp speed. Looking at the chronology of Starfleet, we know that first contact occurred in 2063. This is the first canon time period of warp capability for humans, or at least the earliest that I could find. The Coalition of Planets is formed around 2155, with the Enterprise under Kirk in command at roughly 2266. This puts Pike in command a few years earlier, so at least 2264 to 2265. Even though humanity had discovered warp drive in 2063, 200 years later, there would still be a ship that would go missing without any knowledge of what warp drive is. Right. Now, for some reason, this is a huge deal to people. This continuity gaffe or retcon means a lot to them. There have been a ton of explanations that range from it being a generational ship to the crew simply forgetting after 18 years. These ideas seem unlikely to me personally, but I can't outright discount them. Another theory is that the Telosians are manipulating the crew of the Enterprise so that it makes sense, but we know that the Telosians can't directly control the crew, so it's just one of those things that you can try to make sense, but ultimately you just have to let go. After receiving the SOS, the captain does not initially order Enterprise to assist the survivors, but instead continues towards Vega. He would ultimately retire to his quarters as the crew looks more into the distress call. While at his quarters, he would call for the doctor, and many have given McCoy quite a bit of trouble for enjoying alcohol, but I really think that this was common practice for Starfleet Medical based on everything I see here. I come to this opinion largely based on the fact that the first thing the doctor does is start making the captain a drink. He tries to get the captain drunk to talk to him about his problems. It's effective, though, as Captain Pike does admit he's been having issues ever since he lost people at Rigel 7. Pike admits that he wants to quit the service, he just wants something simpler. During this conversation and enjoyment of alcohol, Spock contacts Pike to confirm that there were indeed survivors on Talos. Pike, presumably at least a little buzzed, orders that the Enterprise sets course for the planet, Warp 7. After a bit of casual misogyny that I've already addressed, the Enterprise arrives to Talos, settling in orbit. Sensors determine the sphere in front of them is indeed a Class M planet with debris from a ship. Pike, Spock, and several officers in varying colors of blue and yellowish green beam down, leaving number one in charge. This is largely due to her being the most experienced officer on the ship, because if there's one thing I know, when you think most experienced on the vessel with everyone present, you think second in command. COs are more ornamental, as any U.S. Naval officer will tell you. The team beams down to find what is mostly a barren wasteland with sparse fauna showing here and there, basically in spurts. The away team finds the survivors in perfect health with only one woman, 
who is apparently 18 and the only one to have clothes that are not in tatters. One exceptionally beautiful female surrounded by a bunch of old men. Well then. Ultimately, this would all be a trap, though, as Pike is captured by a race known as the Telosians. I'll discuss the Telosians and my thoughts on their zoo later on in this episode, but for now, we'll just continue on. Ultimately, the Telosians wish for Pike to choose a woman, giving him an option of three at the end when it seems like the blonde won't work. I'd personally go with the redhead, but that's just me. They want him to live out his fantasies for their amusement and to help propagate the race. How exactly this assists the Telosians in continuing to survive, I'm not sure. It's insinuated they intend to make a human colony from only two people and base it off of the Bible having Adam and Eve. Even though in biblical lore we know other civilizations existed beyond Adam and Eve and they weren't the only humans on Earth, at least according to Genesis, but that's a conversation for another time. Pike resists and decides not to play their games, causing himself and the hot blonde captive a lot of pain. Before being beamed down and presented as meat, as well as having what she does when she's alone with her toys shouted to everyone in the rooftops, Number One would assume command of the Enterprise. Their attempts to break into the Telosian base with lasers would ultimately prove fruitless, and maybe they should have tried using the phase pistols that the United Earth would have about 200 years before, but what would I know? Number One would order that engineering rig to transmit the power from the ship into a weapon on the planet's surface to knock through the doors of the Telosians. While this would be successful, the Telosians utilized their ability to manipulate the minds of the Starfleet personnel into thinking that they didn't breach the defenses. Though, here is a thought. Instead of letting them destroy the rock face with the weapon, why didn't the Telosians just make the crew think they were using the weapon when they actually weren't? To be fair, the Telosians might have wanted a sunroof where they live, so perhaps that's why they let it happen. You never know. As I stated beforehand, the Telosians kidnap both Number One and the most beautiful redhead that will ever be in Starfleet, leading Spock to order the ship to retreat. Unfortunately, all the power on the vessel would be drained, or at least they would believe that the ship could not escape. Back on the planet, Pike realizes that the Telosians cannot read the thoughts of quote-unquote primitive emotions, which apparently is anger and hate, because even though being angry can save your life and is a great response in some circumstances, it's considered primitive. Utilizing his anger, Pike is able to get the jump on one of the Telosians and ultimately escape. Ironically, it seems that may have been the plan all along to have them set up on the surface by their captors. The plan falls to tatters, however, when the Telosians learn that humans are unique in that they don't like being held captive. That's interesting to me, since in theory that means species like Bajorans enjoyed it and had it coming. To be fair, that could just be the Telosians not understanding the galaxy. In the end, Pike and his crew would be free to go, and the blonde who had been there before doesn't go with them because she's ugly. Pike would agree that she should stay, and a good life lesson is taught to girls in the 60s, so moving on. To pause a moment, I find the Telosians exceptionally interesting. They originally lived on the surface, but war forced them underground as the planet became unsustainable. While underground, the Telosians had absolutely nothing to do, so they began to focus on becoming more powerful with their minds and utilizing telepathy. Unfortunately, the power to live out others' fantasies apparently becomes an intoxicating drug, making them want to capture others to enjoy the sensations. The race becomes infatuated with this and chooses to focus on nothing else. They lose their ability to even understand how the machines they had created work. So basically, an idiocracy for aliens. When the Telosians decide to let humanity go, the leader states that they'll ultimately die because they can't rely on humans to sustain their civilization. Pike counters that perhaps the Federation could trade with them, and the former captor responds that trade would mean humanity, and possibly other species, would learn how to do what the Telosians could do, which would ultimately destroy them all. In a way, the Telosians, while being cruel, didn't wish for the destruction of other races and so would choose to condemn themselves to save others. It's a curious premise and something we'll discuss more when we analyze the Prime Directive's view on Talos. In the end, I know I've given this episode a hard time. Welcome to The Lore Reloaded. This part is more so that we all can laugh at those who comment about how I was being unfair and that this was the first episode and was just the original series or was made in the 1960s. Because ultimately, I know they're not going to watch it to the end and just rage comment. I do know that this was a pilot episode and they didn't really have the lore established. I even was on the fence about doing the original series at all after this episode. I reached out to my audience wondering what you guys think and you guys really want me to do it, so we will continue. I'll say this though. Unlike what we see in TNG, DS9, Voyager, and definitely Discovery, everything was still in its infancy. 
They didn't have source material. This isn't laziness. The writers couldn't have ever known what was going to happen to the series. So while I'm going to continue to give it a hard time, I'm not going to look at the inconsistencies as harshly as I do the other series. But all of this is just my opinion. What's yours? Let me know in the comments below.